Hello, my name is Philip Bloom and welcome to this, the review of the Kinefinity Terra 4K part one. Part one implies there'll be a part two, maybe more. Let's just see how this one goes. It's very optimistic. I'm not gonna film them back to back. Let's just stick with part one of one, but maybe two. So this is the Terra 4K. This is not the first camera from Kinefinity, but it's the first one that I've ever used, I've ever shot with. Um, I think I've seen others, maybe at NAB or something like that, but I can't recall. I certainly never shot with any of the other Kinefinity cameras. There's been a few, uh, I can't remember the names of them, but um, Kini Mini, Kini Raw, I'm not sure what else there was, but they're a Chinese brand that haven't really um, made any inroads into the industry. I guess they're pretty small, but also their cameras uh, are very new and unknown. And I think that's kind of what's actually quite exciting about the camera is that it is an unknown in a, an environment where, a market where we know the cameras so well. And it's nice to have a new company come in and hopefully shake up things a little bit. At the price point that it's coming in at, which obviously if I give you the price now that's going to really date this and it does depend on where you buy it from, it competes enormously with a huge amount of cameras. You can use it for, in theory, everything. Corporates, weddings, um, events, um, documentary, fiction, broadcast, cinema. Why not? It kind of, on paper, does it all. The big question that everybody has, including me, is, is it as good as it sounds? And that's what I really want to go through in this review. I've got a lot of cameras, you know? I don't necessarily, I know I don't need any other cameras. I've got enough cameras. I'm filming on the C200, which has fantastic autofocus, perfect for this. Fantastic image I shot that Skiathos cat documentary, mostly with this. I have the, the FS7, the FS5. I have the smaller cameras as well, the A7s, and way too many cameras. But this is different. Um, I think it's the size and the resolutions and the frame rates that it does. I, it just feels different than any of the other cameras. It's also really, actually really well made. Yeah, I just don't know. You don't know what these things are like until you, you get sent them. And first impressions without turning it on is this is a very well made, very solid looking camera that actually doesn't weigh that much. And that sort of thing's actually important to me. I don't want really heavy cameras anymore. I'm too old for that shit. So let's take a look at these features. Let's have a look and see what on paper sounds really good. Well, first off, let's look at the sensor. It's a dual ISO, so very much like the EVA1 and the GH5S, it has uh, dual sensitivity. So it means it's as clean in theory at the two different settings. So on this one, it's 800 and 3200. The sensor size itself is um, what's called sub. Super 35. Now that means it's not Super 35, it's smaller. And that's not ideal. Look, to be frank, I'm after a full frame video camera. I have been for a while. And the closest I've got to that is using a speed booster on the FS5 and FS7, and it gives me really great results. So, unless I, of course, I use the DSLRs, but that's not the same. I want a proper video camera that shoots full frame. This isn't even Super 35, it's smaller, or one point. 85 times crop, whereas Super 35 is generally 1.5 to 1.6, and um, so that's not ideal. Um, I'll talk a little bit about ways around that later on, but 
If you can get past the, the smaller center size, it's not a huge difference between Super 35 when you actually use it in practice, but you know, size is everything. I've said that joke many times before. Um, bigger the better, really. But uh, can you cope with something that's a little bit smaller than you're used to? You tell me. The lens mount is called a kidney mount. There are no lenses for this kidney mount, but what you do have is lots of lens adapters. So, you know, the flange being, you know, so, so small, you can basically put anything on there as long as it fills that sensor. The adapters that I have, uh, I have um, EF and I have um, variations of the EF. I have an EF with a built-in variable ND, which is controlled within the camera. I have a speed booster type EF mount called a Kinney booster, and that takes that 1.85 times crop and turns it into about a 1.3 times crop, which is actually not bad, it's like APS-H, what we had on the 1DC, um, or still do if you still have one of those, and on the um, 1DX Mark II from Canon, both really good cameras. So it's between full frame and Super 35, so that's much, much better. Uh, there's Nikon mounts, there's PL mounts, and there's even a, an E-mount. Now, this is completely passive. It's just a, simply an adapter to, to let you put on the E-mount lenses. My guess is that Sony don't license the E-mount and you'd have to reverse engineer it and it's not been done. Uh, it just means you have to use manual lenses. So things like the Fujinon MK cinema lenses, which I use quite a lot, so it's lucky I have those, or the SLR Magic lenses, or if you have Samyang Cine lenses, the Rokinons, there's loads of E-mount lenses out there which don't have electronics. It just means you, you, know, you won't be able to use any of those actual Sony lenses because there's no power to let you change your aperture, which is kind of important. So, but it, it is there and it's, whether they'll ever bring out a, an actual electronic mount, I don't know. But as it stands, we have electronic mounts for Canon and they work, they support the iris, um, which is obviously incredibly important. One thing it doesn't support right now, and I don't know if that's gonna change, I really would like it to, is none of the Canon mounts support image stabilization on lenses. So just beware. On long lenses, you've got to be, uh, it is a rolling shutter sensor, it's not a global shutter. So you will have some jello if you're on really long lenses and uh, you've got some vibrations. That flexibility of lens mount is a big thing. And it's one of the things that, uh, well, I kind of expect it on the C200 being a Canon camera. You know, I don't expect to be able to use E-mount lenses on this or put speed boosters on. But, um, I mean, that's kind of the thing I want. I want to get a larger than Super 35 sensor. So I can't do it on the C200. I can do it on the Sony FS5 and FS7, but I can't do it on the EVA1 because that is also an EF mount. So having something like this, it's very, it's very, it's very reminiscent of the Sony F55, uh, I think it's called the FZ mount, I could be wrong, and the F5, they both have this mount, which again is no lenses, they're actually for it, it's for adapters.
So it is a 4K camera. Of course it's a 4K camera. You know, I wouldn't be excited if it was anything less than that. I mean, yes, it would be great if it was higher. There is a 6K version of this. I haven't used it. From my understanding, the 6K isn't as good in low light, has more rolling shutter issues, uh, but it's 6K. And it's, so it's not as small, it's actually a, a bigger sensor than, than this. It's not the 1.85 times crop. But I have been told, and I cannot confirm, this is purely from what people have said to me, is the sensor inside this is a better sensor than one in the 6K. This is just what people have told me. I'm not saying it is. Of course, 8K is the next thing, um, even though you know, 4K is, is more than enough, to be honest with you. Maybe for acquisition, sure. But uh, this is not an 8K camera. And I'm sure Kinefinity are gonna bring out an 8K camera. In fact, by the time you watch this, they probably have at least announced an 8K camera. But for the rest of us, 4K is absolutely fine and more than enough. It's all about the quality of the 4K. It's not about the resolution, it's about is it a great 4K? And from what I've done filming-wise, it's a gorgeous 4K. And it shoots in higher frame rates than a lot of cameras out there in this price bracket and actually higher. Full center, 4K DCI, it can shoot up to 75 frames per second. If you drop the vertical resolution to crop the top and bottom to give it effectively around a 2.39 aspect ratio, you can go up to 100 frames per second. Now, if you want to go anything higher than that, you do need to crop in on the sensor very much like you get with actually most of the cameras uh, other than the Sony's out there. Um, Reds, uh, even, even EVA1 does it. The Canon C300 Mark II does it. Uh, not this one, interestingly. Uh, what else does? Um, oh, the Black Magic Ursa uh, Mini Pro does it. So, um, if you want to go higher, we can drop down to a, a micro four thirds crop at a lower resolution. And these are the frame rates that we can shoot in the micro four thirds resolution. Again, if you crop the top and bottom to give it a 2.39 to one aspect ratio, you can go higher. Now, if you wanna go even higher than that, you can crop down to a Super 16. With this camera's firmware, whether it stays with it, I don't know, because most people's cameras who have this don't go as high as my one for some reason, is you can go up to 260 frames per second. Other people are saying 240, but I am able to shoot at 260 frames per second in the Super 16 crop with that 2.39 to one aspect ratio. So those are the resolutions. Um, there's lots of them.
I do love my slow motion and one of the things I really like about this is it does record sound no matter what frame rate you're shooting in, whether it is your normal speed or even as high as your 260 frames per second, it always records the audio. And that's fantastic. If you're recording the audio uh, at your normal speed, at your base time rate, say 25p, that audio will be connected to your ProRes file. Oh yeah, did I tell you? This is records in ProRes. It records in ProRes uh, from proxy to LT to 422 to HQ. It doesn't go anything higher than that. There will be raw coming into this at some point, but it doesn't have this yet. Maybe in the part two, hopefully, I will have the raw. But let's go back to what I was saying about the slow motion recording. So normal speed, the, the audio will be together with the video, basically just a normal video file with sound. But if you go off speed, then that video will be mute, but it will still record the audio as two separate WAV files, left and right. It also does that when you're recording sound on normal speed as well. As well as being on the video file, it will still have that left and right WAV file, which is really, really nice. To, it's a, you know, audio is so important. This camera does actually audio really well. The preamps are pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm not an audio file, and I'm sure sound guys will tell you that it's shit, but basically unless you have a high-end sound devices uh, mixer and recorder, they're gonna say that. Which is fine, it's their job, but they're gonna say that. Every shot that you record is saved as a folder. Inside that folder is all of this information. And the key things are you have your video file, you have the two separate audio, and you also have this text file which gives you all of your settings. And you can put in all sorts of detail in there, which is terrific, it's a really lovely feature. So all of your settings, as long as you have an electronic lens, it will put all your lens settings in there. If you have a truly manual lens, then it obviously won't be able to put those in there, but every other camera setting will be in there. You also have the LUTs. So when you are recording, you have the ability to shoot in um, log, and you also have different LUTs available in the menu. You can load your own in via a USB stick. But it always records in log. It doesn't bake it in. I don't see any option in menus to bake it in, which is fine. What it does give you, though, is the LUT that you have used in that folder. So if you have loaded in a LUT, it will copy that LUT into the folder. So you can just throw it on there in Premiere, whatever it is you're using, and copy that. And that's a terrific thing as well. But it always shoots log, which is fantastic, incredibly important for me to shoot log. And because it's ProRes, it is a 10-bit 422 codec. No 8-bit nonsense here, 10-bit. What about media? What does it record on? SD cards, compact flash? This is the problem with a lot of the cameras, they use expensive media for higher codecs. Thankfully, this actually records on SSD. This is their own KineMag, it's a half a terabyte one. It is thinner than your standard SSDs, but you can buy them this thickness. So I don't know whether they'll be completely supported by it. They will always recommend you use their own media and it's not that expensive, but um, I'm pretty certain if you've got fast enough SSDs of this thickness, they will be fine. And you can get a lot on there, depending on you know your codec and your frame rate. If you are gonna shoot HQ at uh, 4K, in uh, 9 frames per second, you will eat this up quite quickly. But uh, for normal speed stuff, you'll be fine. The side grip here can take, uh, if I get it out, Sony BP30 batteries, like the ones you get inside the old EX1, EX3 and still use on the FS5. And this can power the camera through the grip for about 90 minutes or so. Um, it depends on what you're doing, of course. Um, but that's pretty good. So it does keep the body really nice and tight. But with the, the Kinney back, which you really must get, it's an essential purchase because it does have the audio and the professional connections. If you want proper power that's gonna last you a while, then with the Kinney back, well, then you've got your V-mounts, which can last as well, as long as your V-mounts last. And it's not that hungry a camera, to be honest with you. I've managed to, a full day shooting, uh, also running uh, my small HD monitor um, off of the power, and also a Gratical from Zakuta off of the, the, the V-mount, and um, you know, four of my standard batteries um, they last me a day, and their watt hours are around, I think they're about 80 watt hours. So not even the biggest ones that I've got, so it's not too bad, it's not too hungry. 
There's lots of packages out there to when you buy the camera, depending on what you want, how much you want to spend. You can get their own monitor, which is the Kinemon. Uh, it's okay, it's not a great monitor. It doesn't have any controls to change, you know, things like contrast, brightness, and et cetera. But the advantage of that is it does actually, uh, doesn't use up any of the SDIs and the power, and the image comes through here, which is a Limo connection. Uh, so it's not bad, I mean, it's, it's not that expensive, the actual monitor, it's a good start. But otherwise you do have on the actual body an HDMI out, and you also have uh, two SDI outs on the Kinney back. One thing you do need to know, it doesn't output 4K. It records 4K, but the most it will do is at HD, which is interesting. Um, so if you don't want to record on a, an additional recorder, you can't, unless you're recording HD. So there you go. Um, but it is an SSD at least, so the media isn't crazy expensive. We can also sync the cameras and sync time code, so proper professional connections on here. And also on the back we have two DTAP outs, which is what I use to power the uh, small HD monitor and the Zacuto viewfinder. But you'll only get this power if you do use that Kinney back. If you are just using the side grip, you won't have any power coming from those DTAPs, of course. So, something you need to think about. There is a Wi-Fi connection on the back to put an aerial on. Uh, here's the aerial. Um, standard Wi-Fi aerial. But it's to connect to an app, um, but it, as far as I can see, it, it only works on iOS 10. And so the, the app doesn't work on iOS 11, so that's something hopefully will get updated because it will give you the ability to control things uh, remotely, which is terrific. I would really like to be able to control things remotely. The controls on the side are actually really, really simple. Um, I would like maybe a few more buttons on there, but you kind of get used to it. You have this circular section here, and it consists of three parts. The outer part is basically four shortcuts. So up, right, down, and left. And then we have an internal dial, and that dial is our selections. And then we have another button in the middle, which is actually this you know, select button. We have the back button up here, which doubles as a preset, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. We have the audio options here, and we have our main menu settings there. Below the dial, we have a punch-in, which we can set the strength, and the punch-in is really good, really quality, uh, so it's, that's great. And our playback button, our record button, there's not really a lot to it, you know? It's, it's actually pretty simple. And the menus, once you've had a play with them, you can, you know, become actually really, really simple. So let me just go through them for you. But it is actually really quite useful. It does show you a lot of the features that the camera does. So if you're interested in this camera, I don't recommend skipping past it. If you're after the pretty visuals and you're gonna miss my face, then skip forward. You're not gonna miss my face. So just watch the menus, all right? Okay, so this is a recording of um, running through the menus and showing you what you've got. This is our output. This is what we have on our monitor and you can see we have some information at the top and the bottom. I'm going to go through what those are. If you click the, the middle button on the center circular dial, you get this more detailed view. It shows you your histogram, your waveform, your audio levels, and other stuff. So it's more detail. So to access the settings, resolution, frame rate, the uh, shutter speed, f-stop, all of these are done via this dial. So first off, we're going to have a look at how we change our shutter speed. It doesn't take a lot of uh, use to get used to this. So, so just changing the shutter, you go up. So the easy way to remember that is shut up, shut her up. And you can cycle through using the, the central section, the bit that turns around and you can change your shutter speed. If you want to change it to time, you can do that within the menus, but I'm leaving it at shutter angle. To access the LUT, we click on right and log, neutral and flat. That's what we have in there. Um, I don't have any more LUTs loaded up, but uh, this is fine. And of course it does always record in, um, in log. And whether you shoot in neutral or flat, it will put that corresponding LUT into your record folder. So if you look at the waveform and the histogram, you'll see that it says raw RGB. That means we are measuring 
what's coming off of the sensor, not what the light is, not what's on the display, which is what you often get when you have a waveform or histogram up on a screen. This is obviously way more useful. You need to know what you're actually exposing. You don't want to expose to a LUT. You want to expose to what's actually being recorded. You can change it if you want to actually monitor exposure and, well, actually get your exposure based upon your LUTs. So, for example, if you are shooting and you just want to throw a LUT on in your edit and not worry about grading, you can set your histogram Instead of being raw, set it to post. And as you can see, when I do that, you can see the change on our exposures on the histogram and the raw by flicking between it. It's still recording log, but you're exposing based upon your actual monitoring LUT. So just be mindful of that. If you're not intending to just throw on a LUT, you actually want to grade the log. Make sure you have it set to raw histogram. The right shortcut button does have a secondary use. If you press it twice, it will let you adjust the variable ND if you have that variable ND EF mounts. If you don't have one on there, it won't do anything, obviously. But that's what its secondary use is. All of the shortcuts have a secondary use apart from the top, which is the only one that stays just as your shutter. So if we click the bottom one, this gives us the ability to change our white balance. Deeper in the menus, you can change it to have small increments like this, or you can have larger increments. And if you press the down button again, you are then given the option to change your resolution. It will only give you the option to change the resolution within that center size. So right now we're in Super 35. And so only give us the Super 35 resolutions. To access the other resolutions, we need to go into the main menu and change the sensor size. The left shortcut button is for changing our ISO and also for changing our recording frame rate. Not our base time frame rate, but for anything that is off speed. So first off, we are able to change the ISO. The lowest ISO is actually dependent on something else I will show you later on but right now it is at 320 and the highest I can go is 20,480, which is very high. I will do a, a little low light thing later on, but this just shows you how you change your ISO. Simply the left shortcut button and using that dial, you can cycle through to the ISO that you want. This camera has dual ISO sensitivity, so it performs cleanest at two separate sets of ISO, 800, and 3200. This is a feature we're seeing in lots of Panasonic cameras right now, and it's nice to have it in here. So the cleanest is 800 and 3200. Here's a little example of what this actually means in practice. Anything below 800 ISO, you can do if you, you know, have a lot of light and you, you do need to go lower. The downside is it does affect your dynamic range. 800 is where it performs best. So if you go anything over 800 to 2500, it is adding noise to get there. But when you go to 3200 ISO, it's a native ISO again. So it will be cleaner at 3200 than at 2500. Hopefully that makes sense. Clicking left again will give you your frame rates that you can change for your off speed. When you are set to your base frame rate, you'll see that it is great. But when you change to off speed, it goes yellow. So you always know that you're recording off speed. When it goes gray, that is your time base that you are recording at. That's gonna be your normal speed. Anything yellow is off speed, whether it's below or above. If you want to go higher than the frames per second that it's offering you, it means you're simply gonna to have to change your image size and go to a smaller crop micro four thirds or super 16. And that is done through the main menu. Quickly changing resolutions and especially into high frame rates in pretty much every camera I use is a real pain. One of my favorite things about this camera is that back button, one of the physical buttons on the side, doubles as a shortcut preset button. And you can save eight separate image presets for resolution, for frame rate, for your shutter speed, and for your codec. I have them set to normal speed 4K at the full size sensor going higher and higher and higher to the lowest one, which is number eight, 
which is set to 1920 by 800, so I can get 260 frames per second. When you switch between these different presets, there's no restarting. It's pretty much instant. That is so lovely to simply flick between a different preset and quickly change is a really lovely feature. The button next to it on the camera is the audio shortcut button and you press that and of course it gives you your audio options. The Kini audio is the input at the back. The mic audio level is that internal mic. It has an internal mic. It's not very good. It's very bad in fact, but it is there. Playback level is our headphones. If you don't have any better mics on you and you've only got that internal mic, you will turn the Kini audio to off. But if you want to use those XLR inputs, you turn it on. There is a 3.5 millimeter input jack on the front of the camera. That also is controlled by the mic audio level. So if you don't have the Kini back or you just want to keep it really light and just have say Rode Video Mic Pro, then turn the Kini audio off and change the level with that mic audio level. Phantom power is there for any XLR mics that require phantom power. And you can select the input channels as well. And before you ask, yes, there is a headphone jack on the camera. Inside that main menu, we have the ability to change our codec. There is no RAW currently. It's still ProRes, everything from HQ to 42 to LT and proxy. In the slate, that is where we can change the parameters for that text file that I showed you earlier. You can put in all of these details that you want to. Um, director me, I suppose, cameraman me, operator me. This is a really handy thing to have, to have this text file in every single shot, as long as you can actually keep this up to date. This is where having that app would be so useful to not have to input these sort of things via a dial to be able to actually have it on an app. So hopefully they can get that app sorted. This is something I haven't come across on any other cameras um, that I've used. You are able to actually dial in the, the actual frames per second you want. If one of the presets is not there, you can shoot at any one you want to, as long as it's not higher than that sensor size can actually take. And you can have three different presets and you can select them when you're choosing your frame rate. Very handy, although I can't imagine many times I'm actually gonna need this. It's certainly a nice feature to have. And project frames per second is where we have our standard frame rates, our base frame rates. This is not off speed. These are our standard recording base frame rates. Under ISO highlight stops, we're able to affect, well, basically try to hold a little bit more highlights. And it does make a difference. The standard setting you keep it on, everything I shot has been at 4.3. And this is what they recommend. It's 14 stop dynamic range, this camera. With the help of Bert, I'm just gonna give you a demonstration of what the, well, basically what happens if you put it down too low or if you put it up really high. So, Bert, I'm gonna have to look at the background now, I'm afraid. So, this is at 3.6, so it's the lowest. I don't know why you actually ever want to shoot like that. We have no highlight information at all. This is 5.6 highlights. This is the most you can pull back. In theory, it does add a bit more noise, but if you go to 4.3 highlight stops, this is what you'll see. If you do shoot at the 5.6 highlight stops, you won't be able to go any lower than 800 ISO. I like to keep it at 4.3. In our live view settings, we can change our white balance, have a custom white balance. We can also put on some frame guides. We can change that histogram that I showed you before. We can add some zebras. We can change the magnification settings. We can set it to anamorphic, although the anamorphic mode isn't actually properly working yet because we need the full four by three sensor. Oh yeah, one thing about that magnification, it does work when you're recording, so that's obviously very important to get that focus check. There is no autofocus in this camera, none at all, none at all. Definitely set your video output frames per second to be higher 50p, 60p, because there's a lot less monitor lag than at 24, 25p. At 50p, 60p, it's, it's fine, I don't notice it at all. 
but you will notice it more if you go lower. This is just a monitoring thing. It's not recording. Your internal recording is still going to be at your frame rate that you set it to. The LUT menu is where you load up your LUTs and remove them from the memory. The audio settings we've already gone through. In our sync menu, if you have a tally on the camera, you can change that to on or off. And there's loads of other options on there, including if you want to shoot 3D. Is anybody still shooting 3D? I don't know. In the systems menu, we have the ability to change the fan speed. Um, it's very noisy if you have it to 100%, but unless you're in the baking, 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 baking desert, I don't see why you'd need it that high. I've only ever had it set to 20% and I have it set to fan stop while recording. So it's completely silent. There's the Wi-Fi settings in there, but the Wi-Fi doesn't work. SDI power on enables the SDI output, otherwise it won't work. We can change the clocks, we can change record run or free run for time code, change our language, we only have English or Chinese. We can have a longer startup screen if you want to, don't know why, and you can change your SSD file system. There you are, that's the menus. I told you it'd be interesting. This is a cage that came with it uh, from uh, MovCam, which is nice. And there's loads of additional bits that you can get, uh, like a shoulder setup. I do have that, but um, it's not on right now. I like to keep it really quite small uh, and minimal. But um, certainly if you do want to shoot handheld with it for a, a period of time, you're going to need to get a, a decent um, shoulder system with counterbalance and get that camera up there. And use an EVF, EVF monitor, you know, electronic viewfinder. It's better than the monitor for sure. Um, monitors are great, I like to use them both, but EVFs, you get this nice big screen when you look into it and you've got a diopter to fix it for your crap eyesight and it also gives you privacy from what you're shooting so people can't you know, see what you're up to. Because um, I remember when I was filming in India, in Bombay, and I was using my small HD monitor on the F55 and I attracted a huge crowd around me because they're like looking at what I was actually filming. I should have used my EVF. Of course, I do have to make sure I give a good plug to my cinematic masterclass, um, which you know, is something I spent six months working on last year. It covers so much when it comes to filmmaking, all of these different topics, and it's cheap. It's so affordable, it's like nine and a half hours of content. The Definitive Guide to Filmmaking. Welcome to my Cinematic Masterclass. So here's the link. Do check it out and you can get the first episode free again at this link. Most people are concerned about reliability because it is an unknown. And if a camera goes wrong, if your Sony camera goes wrong, your professional one, you've got prime support, it goes in and gets repaired. Same with your cans, same with your Panasonics, obviously same with your higher end Alexas and your Reds, etc. By being a Chinese company and very few dealers around the world, it is a worry because you know if something does go wrong, these you know these are cameras, they go wrong. Uh, not all the time, but they can go wrong, and you don't want to have to send it all the way back to China and be without it forever. How long? That has always been, I think, one of the biggest issues for me about Kinefinity, and it's kind of put me off buying one of their cameras, is that fact that there's nobody outside of China who deals with them. But there are dealers popping up now around. Um, 
well, I know of the ones in, in Europe, to be honest with you. Uh, there's one in Germany, and there's the guys that I deal with in the UK, uh, Pro AV, who are fantastic guys. And um, so they're the guys who are the dealers in the UK. So if you are in England, uh, go along to these guys and check out the camera. Knowing that these guys are there, if anything goes wrong, they can repair it for me. That is a, a weight off my mind, and it makes this camera something that until this happened, I would not want to rely upon um, in a professional capacity. I have actually been using this now on a documentary that I've been working on. Uh, I can't show you any clips, unfortunately, because it's something I'm gonna be working on throughout the year, and then I will release it. But it's been 100% reliable. I've had a few glitches here and there of having to restart the camera, not actually on this shoot, but just when I've been sort of playing around with it, and it shows actually when I've been like at the BVE show. But other than that, I've not really, I've not had any issues with it whatsoever. It seems to be um, touch wood. There's a wooden table here, stable, and that's important. Um, it's what put me off red in the early days of my Epic M. My camera was really not stable. It was always going wrong. Red have gone past that. Their cameras are much, much, much more reliable than my camera was back in 2011, whenever it was I had it. So this though, it does seem to be very solid and that is incredibly important. It's incredibly important. You can't have a camera go wrong on you. That's just unprofessional and it just means you will not take that camera out on the shoot. If it lets you down, you will leave it behind. You need a camera that is reliable. So I've been using this camera for just over two months and I gotta say, I'm loving it. I really am loving it. It's a terrific image out of the camera. Um, the high frame rates are gorgeous. It's incredibly easy to use. The shortcuts are fantastic. To be able to switch between frame rates that quickly, oh my God, it's a breath of fresh air. It's still fiddly. They need to fix the, the sort of the way the menus actually are. It's really quite hard to see on certain screens. It could do with being different colors, uh, different text. Um, but you get used to the, the shortcuts on the, the dial very, very quickly. But yeah, the image, and I've got past that crop, uh, which is fine actually, look, I've used it, well, I'm using the MK lenses from Fuji, which is what I used on the snow piece and um, on the uh, footbridge. The, the image is fantastic, it's, it's fine. Um, it's just if I want to go that much more shallow, then I do need to use a Kin Enhancer and I can use Canon glass and get that 1.3 times crop, give me the APS-C field of view and depth of field I'm used to on say the Canon 1DC and 1DX Mark II. So, the audio is fine, the battery um, power is, is good. All in all, it just seems like a terrific package. Nothing so far has gone wrong, which could put me off it. And that's why I want to do a part two, so a longer use. And also, once that new firmware comes in, that gives it raw, I wanna see what that raw is like, um, how practical it is to use. From what I understand, it's its, its own format, uh, I think it's a .krw, and it needs to be um, turned into, say, a DNG via their own software, so you can't like put it into Resolve, which is a pain. So it doesn't sound ideal, but we'll see. Also anamorphic mode. I have some anamorphic lenses from SLR Magic. I want to use them, but it needs to be enabled for the full 4.3 aspect ratio of the sensor. It does have that in the 6K right now, and it's coming into the 4K. So that will be in the part two if I do the part two. One thing that does bother me is I'm, I get this pattern on the sensor from bright light, uh, like the sun uh, on there. This rose petal lens, but some people really like it. I don't. It's down to the, uh, as far as I understand it, is down to the uh, the OLPF, the low pass filter on the sensor. And also from what I understand is because this is a, uh, not a production camera, the new OLPF is better. In fact, the new the production camera isn't even this color. This is, uh, I think they're silver. I actually really like this color, um, which is nice. But um, I guess I got, I'd have to get that swapped out at some point if, um, I want to get past it. It's only really bothered me on a couple of things. I've seen it, um, but it's enough for me to go, yeah, I would like it to not do that. What's the rolling shutter like? Well, it's there. It's a rolling shutter. Um, it's 
be good if we didn't have any rolling shutter issues, but we do. It's something I'm just kind of used to now with modern cameras, um, for better or worse. It gives us better sensitivity having the CMOS, but it does give us these issues with the rolling shutter. But um, this doesn't seem to be horrendous at all. It seems to be completely manageable as rolling shutters go. I'd rather have a global shutter, but it doesn't have it, so deal with it. So is this camera too good to be true? Oh, it's really good. It's, it's that, it's knowing what happens when things go wrong. I kind of need something to go wrong for this camera to go down and for me to have to put it through whatever needs to go through to get it repaired. So if it goes to the UK deal or if it has to go back to China, I kind of need to actually go through that to, uh, to see what it's like, to see just how easy or bad that situation is because that's the big test. That's what's going to make people want to buy it, knowing that it can be easily repaired and not have to be shipped off to the other side of the world and who knows how long it will take. But as of right now, it's great. God, these super positive reviews, they worry me because I know things are too good to be true. Hopefully they're not. Thanks for watching and I'll see you at part two at some point, but I'm sure I'll see you before then.